Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. Stephanie Ezeboro, resident family medicine physician here in Des Moines, Iowa. This is my husband, Apostle <laughs> Henry Ezeboro, and he's joining me on this inaugural episode, Conversations with Dr. E. My hope with this series is that you'll be blessed by hearing people's stories. I just wanna chit chat. I'm your sister, I'm your friend. Let's just have a good time. Amen, today we're gonna be discussing on a topic when your facts confront your faith. When those challenges, marital challenges, family challenges, parental challenges, academic challenges, health challenges, whatever you may deem it to be, confront your faith as a Christian, what do you do? What we are trying to do is to uplift those, you know, that are broken, that are down. I believe it's only someone that is up that lifts someone that is down. So we are here to help uplift a brother. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. That's, that's what we're gonna do today. We are a young couple. We're about almost three years in, into this journey of marriage, and we've had a lot of opportunities where we had to have faith with the facts. So this is our story. We're gonna go back to 2016. We found out we were pregnant in June. My husband was so excited. I was like, ooh! You know, I was just finishing medical school and I'm looking forward to a year off of just traveling and now we're pregnant and you know we're going through this motion and we're 20 weeks pregnant and we go to the OB my husband um, escorted me every every time we had went to the OB go to the OB OB says oh you're 20 weeks we're halfway there on Saturday October 21st 2016 I wake up in the morning and I'm like, okay, I got goals to do today. I'm going to clean up the house. I'm going to go get food, get things situated. And when I get up, I start feeling like, hmm, I'm dripping, I'm dripping, you know, dripping fluid. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this? What's going on? I'm like, oh, am I incontinent now? <laughs> am, I, am I peeing on myself now? Is this what pregnancy does? You know, I'm a first time pregnant woman. <laughs> I don't know. My husband is sleeping, snoring, okay? Uh, on, <laughs> Having a good come night's on. rest. I'm just walking and trying to clean up the house and I'm saying, this is continuing to happen. And I sit down and then I leave a, a puddle of mess and I'm like, wow, okay, let me look at this up on the computer and figure what this is out, what's going on here. So I look it up and there, oh, you could possibly rupture your membranes early. Um, I would, fluid leakage, essentially. So I wake up my husband, I say, honey, 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 and he, you know, he's grogging and tired. And I tell him, I think my, my bag broke. He says, that's very early. I don't think so. <laughs> that's super early. I'm like, no, we need to go to the hospital. And he says, okay. So we go to the hospital and indeed, at 20 weeks and one day, um, my bag of water that surrounds the baby to protect him was broken. And that started our journey. Um, I never thought that could happen. I don't know, I never thought it could happen to me. I, I never experienced it with any other family members or any other friends. So we go to the hospital and it becomes overly emotional because they tell us like, they tell us, well, you could have the baby in 48 hours. The, the likelihood of him living is this much percent, this much percent, I just get overwhelmed. <laughs> Essentially, they put, they, Put, give me steroids, they give me antibiotics, and they, you know, it's just, they say, you can't leave the hospital anymore. So that was the beginning of our journey. Um, we stayed in the hospital, hospital for about three to four weeks before um, Junior came at 24 weeks and five days um, because he no longer could handle the intrauterine environment at that point. And then began our NICU journey where we were in the NICU with our son for about four months. Um, ups and downs, he was doing good one day, not so good the other day, doing good another day, not so good, gaining weight, not gaining weight, eating, not eating. It, emotional roller coaster for sure. Uh, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, honestly. It was a journey of facts, meaning faith. And even having the background of medicine, all of that goes out the window when it comes to your own child. You know, it's just, you're just like hoping and praying that everything works out. I remember the first week of Junior's life when we finally got the opportunity to hold them and how much that meant to us, you know? Um, just even though his foot was so small and his body mass was just like 
could barely fit in my, my hand just holding him. I was like, wow, this is my child. This is our child, you know? And um, it's beautiful. I also remember the first time they told us about his, his brain. Uh, he had a bleed, a, a fourth degree, of um, grade four on one side and a grade three. So essentially a stroke in a newborn. And I fainted that day and I was crying hysterically. And my husband was, was telling me, what are you doing? And why are you? <laughs> and he, he's coming from a side of a lack, no medical background and <laughs> having to support him and trying to encourage him as well. Um, he was definitely my backbone during that season. I like the angle you came from when you said, even with your medical background, mm -hmm. you know, when you were confronted with these challenges, you forgot you were a physician, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, before I dive into the challenges we faced, I just want to say that it's easy as a pastor, apostle, or whatever you are, mm -hmm. to lay hand and pray for someone else going through a particular challenge. Mm -hmm. But when it is your own, when that challenge confronts you, when that fact confronts you, that's when it's, I mean, I call it a test of faith. So this, that moment was my test of faith. You know, it was a challenging experience. Like my wife rightly pointed out, when her water broke, she told me her water broke, and I didn't know what it meant for the water to break. <laughs> so I thought she was playing prank because we just saw the, the OB doctor, and uh, we took the ultrasound picture. Mm -hmm. I was so excited, we found out that we were having a baby boy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it meant so much to me. Oh. Um, before they found the boy, it took a while. So we said, oh, maybe he went to play basketball. He went to play football. <laughs> you know, we were having fun with this, you know, with that moment. Yeah. They said, wow, we can't find him. You know, I said, no, don't worry. I'm a soccer player. Maybe he likes soccer, you know. <laughs> Finally, we found him. They said, wow, he has a big feet. He's going to be as tall as his father, obviously. So, I mean, it was a moment of joy, and we slept with that happiness, and that was on a Friday. Then on Saturday, mm. enjoying that moment, thinking through, I was thinking how someday I'll take my son to a basketball training. Mm. You know, someday I will have a matching outfit with my son. Mm. I wasn't actually, I didn't sleep, I slept in thoughts, knowing that I was gonna have a baby boy. You know, so I was having that moment, and my wife came and told me the water broke. So I thought it was, you know, she wanted me to go and mop or scrub the floor. <laughs> so I said, honey, please, let me sleep. But looking at her crying, I said, no, this is not a fake tear. Then I realized, I said, what do you mean that your water broke? She said, it's like the baby is coming out. That's when I said, no, it's too early for the baby to come out. Are you kidding me? When she said, no, the baby is coming out. I said, then why are you crying? We should be happy. I didn't know the baby was meant to stay 40 weeks or 39 something weeks. I was excited. Went to the hospital with her, and they gave her a seat. She sat on that seat. But meanwhile, before we got to the hospital, that was the most miserable ride I've ever had. You know, because she was crying. So getting there, they gave her a seat, and she sat on that seat. That seat got wet immediately. That's when I felt, that's, that was the moment of fact. That was the factual moment for me. Mm -hmm. And I asked, what is going on? I needed some answers. So to cut the long story short, we had the beautiful baby through C-section. Mm -hmm. They told us he wasn't gonna survive. They told us 20, 25% chances of survival. He was one pound and 17 ounces, 14 one, ounces? One pound, 13 ounces. 13 ounces. Yeah. Um, he was in the NICU for 100 and something years. That days. <laughs> or something days. He was in the NICU. Yeah. I was happy that he survived. So I felt that was over. Everything was, you know, going to be good. Yeah. So we had this moment every Thursdays, all the NICU parents come and share their stories. Yeah. Being a servant of the most high, uh, most high God, I always seize every opportunity I have to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So I seize that moment, come, come, you know, kind of, you know, encouraging other parents. I remember a young man that told me 
for 37 years, they've never had a male child in their family. Yeah, listen. And he just got what? The child has Down syndrome. The, I mean, the guy was whipping. It was easy for me to, you know, tell him he's okay, that everything was gonna be fine. The people asked me to pray each time we come there to pray for them. It was easy for me to hug them and pray for them. But I never knew that my, you know, mind was coming. So it was easy to tell the man when he was crying. I said, why are you crying? You're kick the devil. You don't need to cry. You know, the man said, you don't understand. For 37 years, no male child. And this is my moment. All the parents in the NICU, nobody had a good story. If your child is in the NICU, it's which emotionally means draining. it's emotionally draining. Yeah. So one year later, then that's when we found out that Henry Jr., our miracle baby, he was diagnosed of with uh, cerebral palsy. Cerebral yeah. um, uh, that was the moment for me. That was, uh, I didn't know what cerebral palsy was, to be mm -hmm. honest. I still wanted to know because 14 months, my child wasn't even smiling. Yeah. My child wasn't eating. My child wasn't talking. I was waiting for him to say, Dada, I was waiting for that moment. You know, to say Dada, he wasn't sitting by himself for 14 months. So I knew something was wrong, but I, I wanted to know what is it that was wrong. Mm -hmm. So when they told us cerebral palsy, only the answers I got then were my wife cries. She's quite emotional, mm -hmm. and uh, whenever she cries, I looked, I said something is wrong. It means it's time to pray. So that's when I knew there was a problem. And uh, it broke me, you know? It broke me, especially, it broke my heart when the doctors, the caregivers told me, hey, he will never talk. Mm. He'll never you know, walk. When they told me he will never walk. I felt my dream of taking him to soccer tournaments, you know, was gone. Mm. So my happiness was short-lived, you know, so. And I began to ask questions. Why me? I, I said to God, how can you give me something you know I can't handle? Because the worst thing that can happen to every parent is to see your child in pain and you don't understand that that child is in pain because you have no answer to what that child might be going through. So I felt so bad that my son went through this moment alone. Sometimes when you feed him, he wouldn't eat. So I didn't know what was going on. But when we found out, there was a medical problem. So I felt for 14 months, he fought this battle by himself. I didn't know. Those moments he wept, I didn't know why he was weeping because I thought I took good care of him Why weeping. But there was something inside troubling him that I didn't know. That was when my own facts confronted my fate. Suddenly, I almost gave up. Suddenly, I started asking questions. I started asking questions. My facts became my fear, you know? And uh, my fear became my worst nightmare because I began to ask questions if there is God. And if truly he is a God to those that diligently seek him. Because my wife was in first year of her residency. There's no how she's gonna give up her residency to take care of the time. It means that one of us must give up something to take care of this young man. And uh, I've never been fed by a woman. I came from a cultural background in Africa that you take care of your wife and your family. It's the duty of the man to provide. You must work hard. But in this moment, all the facts on the table all became my fears. I won't because of my ego, as an African, asked my wife to quit her profession just to take care of the child. So 
it was time to act, you know. And I, I gave up everything, everything. I gave up everything to be there for my family. So it was a journey. Most times she worked 36 hours in first year. I was a father, I was a, I was a husband, I was a mother, grandmother, everything. <laughs> To cook, Henry. you know, he did everything, honestly. He washed was, all the clothes. I was a driver. You know, driver, everything, honestly. You know? And it, it was interesting kind of watching his journey through his eyes, being that he didn't have the medical background to kind of understand everything. And, you know, I would come home from work, and sometimes he's, oh, Junior's not smiling yet, you know? He's not saying daddy. He's not, he, he's so tough to feed. <coughs> um, you know, and my husband is a very... He keeps a lot of things within him. You know, he doesn't like to discuss. He doesn't like to seek for assistance or help. You know, and I would say, okay, let's just be patient. Let's go to the, you know, the doctor. And the doctor tells us, you know, he's, he was a preemie, so we got to give him time. And um, I could tell that during that season, I think we both went through depression. We both were just overwhelmed with a, a new marriage, a, a child with, that needed special care and a, a job that was just consuming of me so I couldn't be home. So definitely a trial, definitely something that we pulled through together because at this point, Junior's three, you know, we've come to terms with, with his, um, his diagnosis and we never give up hope that God is still able you know, to he can, he will walk, he will talk, he will sing, he will dance, he will play soccer with his dad, he will be the goalkeeper. You know, these things we have faith in that these things will happen, and that in this 2020 season, in this new new decade, God is still able to do miraculous things. You know, I, I hold on to that. I'm a scientist, but I'm also a believer. So that is a little bit about us. That's a little bit about our journey and what has birthed what we hope to bless the world with. How did we come to My Neighbor, My Hero? Before we came to Iowa, we were in Atlanta, Georgia. People told us, when uh -huh. we found out we were moving to Iowa, they said, oh my goodness, you, you may be the only black there. <laughs> <laughs> How are you gonna survive? You know, sometimes people try to discourage you, distract you from your purpose, and uh, by planting a seed of discord in your mind. But I told my wife, let's go. Let's go and do the God's work there. Yeah. You know, don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it hurts me that in this day and age, we still kind of live in a mental slavery, what I call mental slavery. You know, we try to put fears in ourselves. If we had listened to them, we, would have, we wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. It may interest you to know that coming to Iowa, we met a very wonderful man. Yeah. When we went day. to first day called Devon, right? Yes. We went to Homemakers Furniture. Shout out to Homemakers. And, and oh, Homemakers, <laughs> we love you guys. We went to Homemakers Furniture. Yes. We were like, wow, this is a really white state. Yeah. This guy was awesome. He was, he just fell in love with our family. Mm -hmm. Immediately. He helped we, us put our first bed we, together. He we came bought, over. Yeah. We bought the first bed and uh, couch. Yeah. Come on, I don't, I know how to do that, right? <laughs> but I can do it alone. So the guy was happy to come and assist. Mm -hmm. He came with his own tools, yeah. and he shared his story, and he cried like a baby, yeah, exactly. sharing his story. When we shared our story and how our movement and the purpose of God, he's, he was happy, and he gave us some prayer topics. Mm -hmm. We went to Haiti. Yes. Everybody wanted to touch the baby. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah. Everybody. And uh, we were looking for a church, to fellowship with. The first church we went to was uh, Hope. Yeah. Hope, Hope is a wonderful church. I blessed them, they fed us some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> then we were still looking, we moved to downtown Des Moines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found home, finally. No, not just a home where we live, we found a church yeah. we could call home. Eternity Church in Clive. When we started with Eternity, we were like maybe one half percent of of the members, we are black. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I think we are. Everybody was so loving. But they were so loving. So loving and welcoming. I think that time we were just going through a rough season. We were going Junior to, uh, had just turned one, and we would. He also was diagnosed with um, seizures. He was having seizures, infantile spasms, and we were just kind of down and out. The countless hugs we yes. received. Mm -hmm. You know, the countless. I mean, telling us, "Oh, come on, it will be fine." 
you know, the first family that invited us over to their house, Aaron and uh, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, what? Don't mess up Rachel's <laughs> <laughs> You know, we felt loved, to be honest. And that's how the healing process began. Coming back home to share about the love, to share about having the little children, that gave us the momentum. Yeah. That was a faith booster. We said, God, we've received so much love from these people. The one thing I know that God never gives you a trial that will consume you. He mm -hmm. can give you something you cannot handle. Yes. I said, these people have shown us love. When we get up, we want to lift those that are down, mm -hmm. you know, because it's only someone that is up that leaves someone that is down. Yeah. And we have a background. We were able to share this story with smiling, you know, the Bible says joy comes in the morning. I believe that's only in a, what is a developed nation like America. Back there, in some poor countries in Africa and Asia, they can share the same story. So we felt when God gives us this victory, because we know the victory will definitely come, mm. we will return the trophy to him. And the only way we can return the trophy is by helping those that are going through the same situation. Be you in America, you need someone to talk to, you need, you need a shoulder to lean, on, to lean on, you need someone to hug, we are there for you. Because we know how influential and how life-changing it was for us. So we're ready to pass it on, share our story. Every time I sh we share our story, I feel like I, we heal a little more. That's right. Every time I, we share our story, I feel like it, it's more real for us, you know, early on, the idea of having a, a child with disabilities or the idea of having a child with special needs, it just it didn't sit in my heart well because it's hard and you, sometimes I run into the families that, in the hospital and I can tell that they're overwhelmed and it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard um, and they're drenched of energy. Um, but I can also see, I can see the love because that's your child. This is the gift God has given you. Oh, this is the gift, gift that God has given us and you know, this is, it's our blessing, and, he, he, and it's our story to tell, you know? And if we, when, you'll meet Junior soon, but he's an exciting kid. He smiles from ear to ear. He laughs. His laugh can light up a room. Um, every girl loves him, loves his <laughs> eyelashes. Um, he looks just he looks like, like me, the by the way. <laughs> so um, it's a journey, and um, we, we just want to help others. I mean, honestly, because we, we were blessed to have people along the way who helped us to get to where we are today. So we are neighbors and we hope to be your heroes. It's, it's just as simple as that. And we hope to travel and to see the world and to, and to embark and help others as much as we can through medicine and through ministry, because God has blessed us to be a blessing. I, I just want to talk to people of faith that uh, are going through a moment in their life, and you have some questions that you asked. I just want to uh, give you some references in the Bible. Uh, that your child was born deaf, was born blind, was born whatever medical terms mm -hmm. he was born with, doesn't mean that God hates you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. The first time Jesus was confronted, his disciples asked him, Master, why was he born blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin mm -hmm. that he was born blind? And Jesus said, Jesus said, no. He wasn't blind because of anyone's sin, but it's a thing to glorify God. So let us stop that self-condemnation, self-pity, mm -hmm. those suicidal thoughts. Because what devil is trying to do, when one commits suicide, devil don't want you to see the end of it. He doesn't want you to share the story. Imagine if I had committed suicide. Of course, come on. I had suicidal moments. I had some silly thoughts, you know, trying to live with this reality. But one thing that kept me going wasn't just the prayer, but the people around me. When I go to church in authority, I think before, I, before going home, I must have hugged at least 20 or 30 people. <laughs> Trust me. Those hugs are not just, it's a brotherly hug. Amen. You know? You will see some people that tell you, oh, I love the way you worship God. I love the way you do this. They uplift, uplifted, and they keep uplifting our faith. So that you are going through that situation in your life doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Remember Moses. When he called Moses, Moses had a disability. And he wanted to use his disability as an excuse. He first of all asked God, who are you? 
God introduced himself. I am what I am, which means I never change. No matter your situation, I am still your God. And Moses came with an excuse, but that I, I am a stammerer. So Moses was expecting God to heal him of that sickness. Moses was expecting God to say, okay, you're healed, go. No, God allowed it to be so. What did God do? God got him a helper, an interpreter. And Aaron, he says, go, I'm going to give you an interpreter. So why didn't God heal him? God wants your situation to be something that you will use to glorify him. When you make God a means to your situation, the devil tells you, oh, he doesn't hear you. He doesn't hear you. But when you make your situation a means to knowing him, a means to understanding him, because Moses didn't question him when God said, go, I will give you an interpreter. And Aaron, in the Old Testament, stood in the gap of the Holy Spirit. He stood in the gap of the Holy Spirit. And in this generation, God has given us the Holy Spirit. And God is telling you, listen, I live in you. I dwell in you. Don't dwell in self-pity. Don't say, oh, I lost my kidney because I, I lived a bad life. I'm having this liver problem because I, I was a chain smoker. No, God never reminded Moses that he was a murderer. Mm. He flee from Egypt because he killed someone. But when God speaks, he changes your captivity. God never reminds you of your past. So when someone tells you that you are suffering because you were a womanizer, because you were a murderer, that is not from God. When God speaks, his eye is so pure to behold iniquity. His eye is so pure to behold that you sinned. Adam and Eve sinned, and, and God said, Adam, where are you? They reported themselves, self-pity. So God wants friendship, wants relationship with us. So let us not give devil room to blackmail us. So that's what I want to say. So whatever you're going through, the essence of this is to encourage you, wherever you are to uplift you, we may not have answers to your questions, but what did I tell you? The same way he introduced himself to Moses, says, I am what I am. Elisha was a prophet, a major prophet, a senior prophet, mm -hmm. that had double portion of Elijah's anointing. Mm -hmm. He performed all miracles. He raised the dead. He cured the leprous. He healed the sick. He healed and he healed. But what killed him? He died of sickness. Mm -hmm. Second case, chapter 13 from verse 14. Elisha died of sickness. But on his sick bed, he was still speaking God's mind to people, healing the people, telling the king, oh, you do this to defeat the Syrians. So, I mean, that you are blind, that you are deaf, that you are crippled, does not mean that the Holy Spirit is no longer in you. He is there. Mm -hmm. Elisha was sick, but the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. That's why the Bible says, if that same spirit that raised Jesus from dead dwells in you. That spirit will quicken your mortal body. So it's okay to be mad. It's okay to have those suicidal thoughts. Come on, you are human. It's okay to cry. But after crying, let me tell you what to do. Go and kick the devil. That's what I did. I had those moments. I lost money. I lost my time, according to paper. I lost everything. But thank God for the new birth. Thank God that today, I, I, I must say we're the happiest couple in the world. What do you think? We're running it. We're doing <laughs> you know? it. We're doing I, I it. I must confess. I must confess we're the happiest couples. Our test became our testimony Amen. and our mess became our message. It's beautiful. Glory be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the end of our first episode, Conversations with Dr. E. This is our inaugural episode of what we hope will be continual, monthly, weekly, whatever God desires for us to do, of just sharing stories. Star stories from our family, stories from our friends, stories from the community of different journeys, and hopeful that it will bless you. So come back for another as we continue to share our stories and listen to the stories of others and learn oh, and nice. grow and have Christ in the midst of it all because without him we are literally nothing.